Hi there and welcome aboard our dream type. It's our Whitby 42 catch. We're currently moored at East Coast Marina in Manly Boat Harbour in Brisbane. <coughs> We've me. been here for a lot longer than we intended to be this time, but you know, life gets in the way sometimes. We're currently getting ready to uh, cast off the lines and go cruising again. Life has taken over, however, we know that there is a lot of interest with sailing and how people do live on board their boats. So we put out on our social media if people would like to put questions to us and we would then answer them as honestly as we could. It's been amazing the number that have come through. Some were practically the same as everybody else's as in you know that we had four or five that were all asking the same question. So we're going to nut them down today and we're going to give you the answers to those questions. Yeah, so um, a bit of a Q&A and, and hope you find it of interest. As Karen said, we've, we've got about 30 questions we're going to see if we can get through. We'll just see how, yeah. uh, how long it runs. First one we've got Jessica Heyman. She's asked, what sailing had you done prior to buying your own boat? This is one that we get quite often, don't it we? Is. Yeah. <laughs> and how much sailing had we done, Rob? Uh, before we decided to go sailing and cruising, mm -hmm. we'd done not much. Um, literally, when I was a younger guy, before marriage and, um, and mortgage. What did they say? Mortgage, marriage and kids? <laughs> <That's it. laughs> Back then, I did, I did some sailing and really enjoyed it, but it was literally only day sails. Get on a boat in the morning, sail with a friend, and be back on the dock in the afternoon. Um, and that was the, the full extent of my sailing at that stage. Mine was much younger um, with the sailing club at Ellie Beach. However, I didn't take much notice of my sailing instructors. And maybe if I had, I'd be a better sailor now. <laughs> but anyway, um, and then the same, you know, with marriage, mortgage, yep. kids, all of that. You just don't have time for it. Um, careers, you know, it's, it all takes over. So until we decided to go sailing, not we, much. Yeah, we became empty nesters. The, the kids mm. uh, became independent life forces out on their own and we were deciding what we were going to do with the rest of our lives and sailing really did seem like an attractive option. We went and did our uh, RYA courses. I think it was back in 2009 and 2010 yes, that's from uh, Covenant Crew through to uh, Skipper's and uh, we both did the, the same courses. We wanted to be both qualified the same. We were ready to go and launch and buy ourselves a boat. <laughs> and uh, a few things got in the way, like a global financial crisis, and uh, in our case, um, some severe floods around our home in Ipswich, which, affect, which affected real estate values very badly. Um, so- Not only that, but the home. <laughs> Yeah, and home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our, our home was uh, flood affected, so we put a dent in those plans to buy a boat. And in in retrospect, that was probably a good thing because what we did, we decided, what are we going to do? Go back to work, or are we going to to do something else? And we decided, literally, stuff it. Let's go sailing anyway. And the way we did it, we went on the internet and we looked for positions as a crew. We did. And we really enjoyed the crewing, in actual fact. Um, we learnt so much more than what we would have if we'd just gone and bought our boat. Put it, we probably would have damaged us and the boat a lot more. Oh, so, plenty of people do it and do it quite successfully. Absolutely. But as, as I feel a, that we learned so much more by crewing. We, what, we crewed as on four different boats. Four different boats. The first one from uh, Cairns in Australia through to Bali. Um, and that was a 57-foot uh, Beneteau. Mm -hmm. Then we got on a 50-foot catch uh, and uh, crewed it from Bali through to Malaysia. And I think we must have been getting a taste for uh, big boats because our next crewing job was in Thailand on a 56-foot oyster. Oh, was she nice. <laughs> it was a beautiful yeah. boat. We, we sailed her in the uh, King's Cup regatta at Phuket and as Karen said, absolutely glorious boat. Slightly out of our budget yeah. though. We actually got to sail her twice, we must say. We did. We'll come back to the second <laughs> time that we sail on Curious. But after we did the King's Cup regatta, we flew back to Australia for five weeks to see the family, 
see the grandchildren, pat them on the heads as they were growing up. You know, some of them I was, you know, patting up here instead of down here. <laughs> but then we went to the Mediterranean and we started crewing on a super yacht. Well, yeah, it was a 72-foot shipman. Um, once again, a magnificent boat, uh, very high-powered. Uh, we were able to spend um, about three months on that boat from Italy uh, down to Northern Africa and Tunisia, up through the Balearics and across to the, the uh, Spanish coast. Um, absolutely fantastic mm. experience. Professional skipper on board, Tim, we learned a lot from him. And then as Karen alluded to, we got the opportunity to rejoin Curious. Uh, by then it was in the Mediterranean and um, Steve Brown, the skipper, invited us to crew with him from Gibraltar. Uh, up the Spanish and Portuguese coast and then across the infamous Bay of Biscay back yes. to the UK. Back to the UK and actually back to Ipswich. So for us it was quite exciting being that we left Ipswich, <laughs> and Ipswich Australia. Australia to then sail a boat to Ipswich in UK. But we did some great things along that way yeah. that we ended up going up the Thames and we were there for the Queen's Jubilee. An amazing experience. That's a pretty long answer <laughs> yes, to the question. It is. We actually had about 12 months experience of, of ocean cruising um, yes. before we did purchase a boat. And even then, we'd uh, been crewing it with a, uh, a wonderful British chap called Mark. Uh, we crewed with him um, a couple of times uh, for extended periods. And we hooked back up in the UK when we got off Curious. And we, uh, we went cruising together. We bought a, um, as you know, 43 deck salon in uh, Palma, Mallorca in Spain. And spent two years uh, on that boat in the Mediterranean, which was yeah, a, a wonderful experience of sailing our own boat, yes. being in control. Of where we were going and what we were doing, and yeah, yeah. it was fab. It so was really good. If you're wondering about should you buy a boat, um, yes, it's wonderful to get some new experience with, mm. uh, with, with, with knowledgeable people first, but we know so many people that literally you know, have bought a boat and off untied they went. the lines <laughs> and look you get through it it's you know it's they've all survived they have. They've as far had, as we know they have some of them have <laughs> given themselves a fright along the way but yeah it's it's a case of be sensible it and, is and, uh, sal yeah. within your means um yeah. but it was a great experience for us to uh, have spent 12 months on, on four different boats uh, learning what to do and sometimes what not to do yes but uh, we thank all of those people that took us aboard. Yeah, absolutely. You know, to share your home with somebody else as crew is is really, you know, and now we do that as well. Oh, yeah, we... People. So we like to share our experience with others as well. So. We, we enjoy having crew aboard. We enjoy sailing on our own. Yeah. But we also enjoy having um, people aboard with us. So what's our next question, Rob? Uh, Steve Norman has asked, do you have a land base? like a house or a unit? Mm, no, we don't. <laughs> to fund us going and to fund buying a boat, we actually sold our family home um, and that has been funding us um, sailing up to this point. Um, we're now of age <laughs> that we have uh, some super kick in and pension and so forth. So that helps us along. We so we don't have a home to come home to. Um, some people, when we speak to them out there, say, aren't you scared about that? Aren't you, you know, concerned about the future? The future will look after itself. We're here, you know, on this earth for a very short time and we intend to enjoy every moment of it. And so we'll take that step now. Absolutely. We've been living this lifestyle for 11 years. Um, back to work for briefly for a couple of times just to top things up but uh, we wouldn't trade it for anything no, absolutely anything yes we don't have the security of a land base our mailing address is our daughter's house yes. which is wonderful because <laughs> yes. you, you know the world can't exist for you unless you have a mailing address yeah, no, so. governments don't like it if you are a nomad <laughs> so yeah it's um thankfully she's taken that job on um, yeah. Yep. So, so that's the answer to that. No, we don't have a house or unit. We don't have a land base. Closest thing we have a land base is we recently did a, a van conversion 
with a delivery van that we turned into a camper van. We yes. call it our land yacht and um, the, uh, enjoyed a great trip to Tasmania and that. And it's, uh, well, when we go full time cruising, it just gets parked up and it's there for when we come back to land. Yeah. That's, that's as close as it is. Yeah. Uh, here's one that we'll, you'll have a very short answer to and mine will be slightly longer. Jennifer Ryan asks, do you suffer from seasickness? No. <laughs> I can and I have. When we first went cruising, I found that I got seasick the first two or three days. Um, we left Cairns and I was horribly seasick the first night and it lasted mm. for probably 24 hours. Uh, and I didn't have any seasickness again on that entire trip through to Thailand. We had five weeks off the boat, flew to the Mediterranean, uh, then we spent about a month getting that 72 footer ready and when we left we sailed straight into a, um, a bora. Uh, incredible bora yeah, 60 wind, knots. Um, rough seas and once again I was um, quite seasick. Horribly uh, seasick. By the third mm. day I was pretty pretty uh, incapacitated. Yes. Um, by the time we arrived in Malta uh, from northern Italy um, I was on my feet and fine and what it's come down to is I just have to be aware. Um, I haven't been seasick since then and that was 2012. 12. Yeah. Um, I haven't physically been seasick but I know uh, if the weather's particularly rough I need to be in the cockpit doing things or in my bunk. I won't be down here below preparing a meal or, or reading or doing any computer work or anything like that. That will trigger it. Well, even above, you know, you don't read or anything no. other than other than what we need. He needs to read navigation-wise while Strobs on watch. He doesn't do any no. reading for the first few days. Yeah, it's only the first couple of days mm. when we leave leave the dock after being ashore for quite a time. And literally, the key for me is the horizon. If you can see the horizon and you have fresh air, um, I'm pretty good. And my advice to anyone if they have a seasickness problem is make sure you're always where you can see the horizon. Make sure you can get some um, fresh air in your face. And if in doubt, make sure you're actually doing something that takes your mind off it. And the greatest thing on a sailboat is start helming. If you can mm. helm the boat, your mind's active with that, you've got fresh air, you're watching their eyes and, mm. and seasickness, to be honest, is um, is not a problem. So that's we, the best yeah. tip we can give. Yeah, we, we um, tried a lot of remedies for Rob um, to see what worked and what didn't work. Um, and I did actually write a blog on it. Um, so if you want to head over to Dreamtime Sales blog on Blogspot um, and look up the contents. Yeah, we'll put, actually we'll yeah. put a link in the in the um, description, description below. below the video yeah. on the YouTube video. And we'll probably have a few links for you there mm. on different issues, but yeah. we'll put a link to our blog about um, the, the seasickness. Sea sickness. There. Because many people, you know, different remedies help, and some of them are natural. Some of them we have to actually go to a chemical-based uh, medication. So next, What's question? The next one, Bradley Cross asks, "What do you find the hardest thing to do on board?" Um, I suppose if you asked in the beginning there probably were a few other <laughs> items that we um, found difficult on board. Can't really remember those now after this number of years. But I still find doing the washing on board the most difficult. It's time consuming, it's hand washing, it's annoying and it depends in what weather you're in as well, what temperatures. I mean cooler weather, you've got heavier gear, you know, well, this probably leads to the question from Amanda, how do you oh. do your washing? Do you have a washing machine? Ah, no, we don't have a washing machine. Oh, we... I bought you a twin car. <laughs> yeah, Rob was very nice and bought me, uh, bought me, not us, bought me a twin tub, <laughs> which is two 20 litre buckets <laughs> and with lids on. And we quite simply put them on the aft, one on port, one on starboard and put the washing in, you know, one with the soap suds and as we sail it agitates and when we get there I transfer it over into the rinse bucket, wring it out, put it into the rinse bucket and we start all over again. Um, no dryer, so you've got to have the right weather to be able to absolutely. hang your washing. Yeah. And, yeah. 
Yeah. So we have a, you know, line, a clothesline that goes from all the stays all the way around to the bow, all the way back to the stern, and washings hung everywhere. And I think if you get to an anchorage at some stage in your lives, you'll see cruisers out there with washing everywhere. <laughs> in, in the meantime, like uh, while we're in the marina, yeah. when we go and visit um, our daughter, our son, Friends. Karen's parents, we arrive with a bag of washing, washing. and say, hi! We're here, where's the washing machine? Uh, Is it free? <laughs> and obviously, uh, on the odd occasions we go into marinas, we uh, have the opportunity yeah, to use, use the laundromats. The, the laundromats. Mm. Or even when we're anchored off, if we're anchored off somewhere where we're um, close enough mm. to a laundromat, we'll do it. Hardest thing on board for me, maybe, is uh, if the weather's rough, is actually, um, well, sleeping on a night passage for me. Uh, the first night, mm. I don't even bother really. I might take a, a Well, nap. I suppose that's probably me too. Um, yeah. But yeah, if it's rough, you know, the first couple of days, you find it, um, I find it a bit hard to sleep. But after that, your body says you need it. Mm. And as soon as you're not on watch, you just boom. I can out and I'll sleep until the alarm goes off. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, we do three hours on, three hours off, and I even sleep in my, oh. um, in my... Okay. Here we go. This leads into Claire oh. Davidson's question. What are the challenges sailing at night? Exactly that. Um, you don't get in a rhythm, I don't think, until about the third day when Rob said, your body just says, that's it, you have to sleep. So when we're three hours on, three hours off, um, you know, you just go to sleep. And especially at night, you just, you know, your body says sleep, you sleep, and I even sleep in my life vest because if Rob needs me, I know by the time you get up, you're a bit groggy, you put the life vest on, it's all really difficult. So I have a life vest that I'm really comfortable in sleeping in, and if he needs me up on deck, I'm straight up. Yeah, I'm pretty much the same. Um, as Karen says, once you've, probably even for me, the second night, I'm pretty good, I can sleep. Um, if we're only doing a one night overnighter, to be honest, I, f I can do that on my own just about. Yeah, um, I'll stay up. I'll stay up, you know, um, to whatever. And Rob do, has a bit of a rest. And you'll then... do your one night passage, and then if you're still underway next day, I might uh, have a nap. But then once you uh, you're into the anchorage, mm. it's time to uh, have a good sleep. The other challenges, other than sleep, is um, staying awake because you are tired <laughs> <Don't> um, <laughs> at night. We've got two different methods. Now, I, I listen to podcasts with one earpiece in, so I'm not disturbing uh, anyone else on board. So while I'm on, on watch, um, the podcasts are about an hour long, and you, you listen to one, you listen to two, and you listen to three, and go, oh, hang on, my watch is over. Mm. And if you get a longer one, I've quite often gone, oh, it's time for Karen's watch, but this isn't finished. And then Karen might get an hour, no, <laughs> Another extra, hour. Extra, extra half or an hour of sleep because I'm really interested in the podcast that I'm listening to. And it keeps me alert and attentive um, at night. Um, yeah, I listen to music. Again, having only one earpiece in, I mean, the key of why you're sailing at night is that the boat is underway, so you need to be able to hear what's going on. And especially at nights in the tropics, you do get a lot of squalls, so you need to be able to hear those squalls coming and the wind changes, so you need to be able to react to the yeah, boat. Yeah, because you can't see them. No, you can't see them at night. And that, I mean, that's the thing at night. You are, especially if you have a moonless night, you are out there in the pitch black. I mean, it, it, I mean, it can be absolutely beautiful, but it can be quite eerie at times too when, you know, you're sailing along no sounds whatsoever other than just the wind. I love it. I, oh. I absolutely love night sailing. I yeah. really do. Um, in nice conditions, uh, a night, there's nothing better than a night passage no, to sit there. The stars beautiful. out at sea are 20-fold yeah. of yeah. what you'll see on land. Um, even it's out, mesmerizing. You it's know, even away from the city lights on land, you still don't see quite what you do out in that no. clear sea air, it's... away from any light pollution and often away from any yeah. air pollution. Uh, next one's from Michael Bruce. What rig do you use to catch all those fish? <laughs> and, and what do you pour down their gills? Um, okay, well, we refer to it as a Spiro rig. Because and that's probably what he's asking because he's probably looked for a Spiro rig. <laughs> it's, um, 
here in East Coast Marina, our next door neighbour, the boat next to us, is a, a wonderful uh, Greek gentleman called Spiro. And he is the absolute master of fishing Morton Bay. Yes, I think he knows all the fish out there by name. <laughs> and, um, yeah, he, he literally is. Well, he certainly incredible. knows where the spots are because he yeah. comes back with fish all the time. And he actually um, uh, helped us out with this and told us this, uh, this particular rig to use for trolling when we're underway. And it's, it's a, a dive board. I'll use some video over this to um, illustrate it more. But it's a dive board that's designed to carry your line down to around about um, well, three to five metres under the water. So rather than a, a sinker to get it down there, which, you know, the faster you go, the, the closer to the surface your lure is going to end up, the dive board carries the line down to about that three to five metres. And it's then got uh, 12 foot, about three and a half metres of line behind the board to your lure. And uh, we, in this case, we yeah. just use a silver spoon lure with this, <laughs> and it really dances behind the dive board very nicely. We also use uh, a more conventional, um, often called a Qantas lure, a red and white lure. They're very popular in Australia, um, and it doesn't use a dive board. It's got a little uh, nose piece that takes it down a bit. I don't think it's as effective as the dive right. board. What we've found is, since we've started using this, we catch a lot more fish. Um, we sometimes get broken off because we're using a rod with this particular type. If you try and use a heavy tow line, it just doesn't work. You've got to just use a, a, a conventional fishing line. Um, so we'll, we'll get broken off by the really big fish, whereas when we just towed a big lure on literally a right. rope, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, which most cruisers do. It didn't. It didn't matter yeah. what you hooked. It wasn't going to get off unless <laughs> the hook straightened, because you just tow the thing until it drowned. Mm. But uh, we found with this um, the dive board, this bureau rig, we catch a lot more fish, and it keeps us fed. We catch um, mainly mackerel on that setup. Yeah, as um, in the full range. Spotty map, mackerel, yeah. school mackerel, Spanish mackerel, the occasional tuna. Whereas on the um, Qantas lure, yes, we catch a lot more tuna. Than, uh, than anything mm, else. We very rarely actually catch mackerel on the corners. Yeah. You know, uh, th and we, we did a test, didn't we, this last season. We yeah. had both of them out, and the tuna were coming left, right, and center on the corners. Um, but yeah, the. Um, yeah. So, what do we pour down their gills? Well, we pre marinate them. <laughs> so, if you're a vodka drinker, it's, <laughs> it's, it's cheap alcohol. It's, <laughs> Cheap spirits, <laughs> yeah, literally. Cheap spirits. We've been using um, uh, some rum because somebody gave us, very kindly gave us a bottle of rum and neither of us are real rum drinkers. Right. Um, but any cheap spirit. Mm. And what it does is pour it down the gill and it just calms the fish really quickly um, and makes it so much easier to get the hook out and etc. And you, you don't have a fish that's flogging all over the deck and I think it's, it's far more humane for the fish itself it as is. well. Um, so, yeah, it gets out there with a bit of a kick, and as Karen says, we've pre-marinated it. <laughs> but yeah, it's literally uh, a bit of rum or... or in a squirt bottle, cheap, a, sauce, any, a sauce Any bottle cheap or spirit, a, che yeah. a cheap brandy or something, yeah. in a squirt bottle, squirt a bit in their gills, and it just calms them down instantly yeah. and makes them easier to handle. Oh, here's a big one. Alan Powell asks, why did you buy a catch? <laughs> we weren't going to be buying a catch. We, when we came back from the Mediterranean and we sold our boat in um, in Sicily, we were on the hunt for a boat back here in Australia so that we were closer to family. Um, of course, we had the list that you know, and there were so many boats on the market, and it was a case that Rob was saying, "You hunt for it. You put them down in the short list." and make the appointments with brokers and then we'll, you know. I'll quickly explain our process. Yeah. We, we literally did a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet, and it had all our wood likes. All the um, requirements. We would yeah. like a centre cockpit. Not yeah. absolutely necessary, but we'd like, like a centre cockpit. Uh, we definitely wanted two heads. Yes, right? wanted an absolute must on my point. Was absolutely to have two, two heads. heads. Um, we wanted a boat that had AIS, had radar, had you know good instrumentation, 
preferably had been re-rigged recently. All the things that you want on a boat would like, and then as we saw a boat, we'd put in its name, who the broker was, and tick which boxes it literally filled. ticked. Yeah, it filled. And we were always going to be liverboards, so a very prime thing was we had to have a boat that had a good galley and was going to be comfortable to live aboard. Yes. And we probably looked oh. at a um, hundred boats. A hundred or more. And it was, yeah. one thing we decided was not to prejudge anything. We had a limited budget, very limited budget, oh. and we said, okay, if it fits in the budget, we we'll look at, look at it. it. So I had made appointments with a, um, a lovely broker who is, Anita, still remained a great friend to this day. And um, I said to Rob, this day we're going, I've booked the, you know, and we're walking down the dock and I said, Anita is in front of us, and I said to Rob, well, the first boat we're looking at is a navy blue catch. Which were two things <laughs> that were not on our list. <laughs> and had been discussed that we didn't want. <laughs> didn't, didn't want a navy blue hull oh. because the perception is that they're too hot and they take more maintenance and all that sort of thing. And we didn't particularly want a catch. We'd for, sail a catch yeah, and didn't and have a problem look, with it. And we enjoyed sailing Atlantia um, in, from um, Bali through to Malaysia. There was no problem, but you know, for us it was the cost of extra sales, the rigging, the handling of blah blah blah. And so the look that Rob gave me was quite interesting. And I remember Anita turning back across her shoulder, going, oh. But we had made the point not to prejudge That's anything. That's exactly right. So we looked at, um, at this boat, um, the Whitby 42 Catch Blue Hull, uh, and from the time we got in the cockpit with its, with its hard cockpit cover and its full enclosure um, and then down into the living side of this boat, I mean it, it ticked a hell of a lot of boxes. Mm. You know, there were a few. There was two X's yeah. with the blue hole and the fact it was a catch, mm -hmm. and the fact that the rigging was actually well over ten years yes, old. So we knew we were replaced. going to have to re-rig it. Mm. But we would have looked at another thirty or forty boats, and we'd look at a boat and say, "It's not as good as that catch." catch. And in the end, yeah, we realised it hasn't got as many features as that catch. We oh, realised uh, the galley's we were, nowhere near as nice as that catch. <laughs> we were procrastinating. We were, we were, and Anita actually knew straight away. She said that when we came on board, that this was the boat for us, and she took us to see very, you know, like a great diversity of boats after that. And she just kept shaking her head. And I think at one stage she said, "You know, you like that catch, don't you?" Yeah, we do. <laughs> so. The we offer bought, was put in. Yeah. We put the offer in. We came to terms with the owner. Um, we have had our dream time for seven years now. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Um, absolutely love her. We've um, really learnt how to maximise sailing the catch. Yes. Um, the, the, she's a cutter rig catch, so um, uh, Genoa, staysail, mainsail, and, um, and of course the mizzen. And our beautiful, beautiful and our spinnaker. asymmetric spinnaker. Asymmetric. And what it does, it gives us so much variety with the um, sail plan. Mm. We can change things for different conditions and we've, we've learnt what the boat is most comfortable with. And to be honest, she's a heavy, full keel cruising boat. Yes, she you, is heavy. You can take, <laughs> take around the world in any conditions. Yes. Um, well, she's done a lot more miles than what we have. I mean, she's come from Canada, so she's, she was built in Ontario, Canada, so she's come all the way across. So We're only the third owner. She's yes. 40 years old later on this year. Yeah. Um, we'll have to have a birthday party. I'm not sure whether September, she'll get a cake. End of September. So, yeah, next month. Yeah. So, yeah, she'll be 40 years old. And um, she is just such a, a wonderful, mm. strong, well-behaved, elegant lady for us that we love her. Mm. As I say, we're only the third owner for a 40-year-old boat. Um, so talking it, about the boat, hopefully it'll be quite a while before there's a fourth owner. <laughs> yes, exactly. So talking about the boat, one of our biggest questions asked was, "Can we have a look through your boat?" Well, absolutely, you can look through the boat. We've had many guests on board to look through. However, we are going to do a boat tour. I know that that has been asked of us in the past, and we just haven't got around to it. Well, we did film it all. Yeah. And then Karen did a 
heck of a lot of redecoration around the place. We're oh. thinking, why are we going to show what it was? Because I hadn't edited it up yet. Um, so we, you've got a couple of little things to finish in the uh, galley and the forehead head. Yeah. And well. then we're going to do uh, shoot a whole new boat tour. Yeah. Um, so that'll be one of our upcoming videos for there you. There we go. So watch out for that one. Uh, the next one. Dragonfly sailing us, would you choose a catch again? My answer there would be, if we were changing boats, um, I would be picking the boat on the boat, its livability, its performance. Not because it's a catch. I wouldn't pick yeah. it because it's a catch. If it was a catch, that's fine. Mm. If it's not a catch, if it's a sloop, that's also fine. Yeah. Um, Quite frankly, so the answer to that is not necessarily. Yeah. Um, so Lloyd's question, I notice you sail with your staysail a lot. What advantage does it give you and what point of sail is it most useful? Okay, um, she's an upwind sail for us. It really does provide a lot of benefit if we have the wind forward of the beam. Um, we can create a wonderful slot effect between our Genoa and that second head that's all the stay saw. Our Genoa though is really a Yankee. Yeah, it's, yeah, not, a huge, it's not a huge it's not a huge head saw, no. our, our main one. And Karen's probably right, it's uh, it's, it's more of a Yankee yeah, than a genuine Genoa. Cut, yeah. It's very high cut. Mm -hmm. And what we get with the stay saw, as I said, is this slot effect where they just work beautifully together. When we put the stay saw out we tend to have to ease the um, Genoa a bit. Yep. Uh, and it, it gives us about half a knot um, in general terms. Absolutely. But the boat becomes far nicer balanced when you... Especially for upwind, yeah. Yeah, because we've got a very large mizzen sail. The, um, this boat was designed by a genius called Ted Brewer, um, who uh, designed many, many boats. But this is, this is one that I, th I think there was about 400 of these, 600 of these built. Uh, no, we're 191, we're right in the middle. That's so right, 300, 362, yeah. 362. Yeah. So Karen's a stats person. Yeah, <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, Ted Brewer designed this boat and put a lot of fantastic features in it. Unfortunately, we lost Ted... Um, only last year. Only last year. Yeah. Uh, his wife Betty is still um, still with us and still... Uh, in contact with us. Contact. Ted was in contact <laughs> us with yeah, us when we, um, when we well, first started sailing the boat yeah. and... Well, and we Betty is. Her and when we did the re-rigging, and yeah, yeah, Betty still follows the uh, Whitby Facebook group. So hi, group and, and she watches YouTube. So hi, Betty. Hi, Betty. We're always thinking of you, and quite often um, when I'll do something, I'll go, "Thank you, Mr. Brewer." <laughs> yeah, he did a wonderful job yeah. with this boat. But um, uh, the 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 staysail balances the mizzen. If we're sailing downwind, we quite often leave the mizzen down because it's so big it gives us a fair bit of weather helm and pushes the back of the boat around. What we prefer to do is leave the mizzen in the bag downwind and have our main and our headsail pull the boat along rather than have it pushed from the stern. And particularly with the following sea, it just behaves a lot nicer. And can I say, that wasn't a Ted Broad design fault. No, no. no. But, <laughs> yes. um, Whitby also built the boat, Whitby Boat Works also built uh, the Alberg 30s. Mm and they had a particular mast that they were using in the Alberg 30 and when Ted designed the boat they went oh this mast we've already got isn't much bigger and we can use the same mast and, and boom pretty well and we'll have the economy of scale because we're buying so much more for the two boats so we've got a bigger mizzen than Ted actually designed the boat for yeah. so we, we often have it um, reefed Yes. Or as I say, downwind, we don't even put it up. We use the, um, the furred sails and it pulls the boat along. Upwind, the mizzen's fantastic. Yes. And used with the staysail, balances the boat. The other advantage of the staysail is if we're in heavy weather, we can sail with a reefed mizzen and a reefed staysail and it balances the boat nicely. Leave the main down, yep. leave the Yankee. Or the other yep, alternative down. is to reef the main right down and then you've got your main and your staysail right in the center of effort at your, ma at your mast. Uh, whereas if you have a, a reefed Genoa, it's up here, your reef main is here, and they're not yeah. working together as much. Mm. So that's the advantage for a staysail for us, and that's yeah. how we find it. That's how we find it. The other question regarding sails was from um, SV Sapphire. Sapphire. Can you explain how your mainsail works? 
Well, we have a leisure furl in boom mm -hmm. furling main. Um, we and we've sailed with all. We've sailed we've, with in mast. We've sailed traditional slab reef. Um, yeah. So, and we love this. <laughs> the, it's so good. The leisure furl in boom furling for us was a real feature of this boat. Yes. We'd never sailed with an in-boom furler. We've, as Karen said, we've sailed with an in-mast furling system on a number of boats. Uh, we've sailed with slab reefs a number of times, uh, normal conventional. And everything we'd seen and read about the leisure furl, we'd like the idea of. Um, leisure furl themselves have a number of excellent YouTube videos. We'll, we'll mm. bung a link into yeah. those comments below so you can have a look. Because we watched heaps of them. <laughs> so literally the mainsail is rolled around a mandrel inside the boom. Okay, it goes up a track as conventionally. We have one electric winch on this boat, which is used for that mainsail. So Karen from the cockpit, you never have to leave the cockpit on this boat to put a sail up, puts the, uh, the main sheet on the electric, uh, the, no, the, the halyard. main halyard on yeah. the electric winch, and we have a furling line, which is then fed out and kept tension. So literally put a foot on the button and up goes the main rolling out from inside the boom. And we just do the reverse to put it down. So and I put on, you know, your actual furling line onto the electric winch and I feed out the halyard and it just comes down at a, a nice yeah. steady rate. The, I think the wonderful thing that I love about it is, as everybody knows, reefing can always be difficult. Um, with this, we don't leave the cockpit from it at all, and it's a fully battened mainsail. Yeah, conventional horizontal, horizontal batten, battens, so you get a nice sail shape. Yeah. Unlike the in-mast furlers with their, their uh, vertical. vertical battens that often get jammed in the mast, and you can never get a real sail, sail performance no sail way. shape with one. So we get that wonderful sail shape, performance out of it, but every one of those battens once it's underneath the mandrel, is a reefing point. So we've actually got five reef points if required. Yeah, so our first reef is is like yeah. very mild, yeah. but we can go down to just having a handkerchief of, of mainsail yeah. up, which yeah. is uh, virtually like having a storm, storm sail. sail. So we love the leisure furl. If you're interested in knowing more, check out that link down in yeah. comments, have a look at their, um, their videos. Uh, in in most conditions, we can actually um, reef that thing sailing downwind. We don't even have to turn up to wind. So it's have a look at those videos. It's it's a really cool system and it's great for short end sailing. It is. Sailing. It is. The next question is from uh, Tony Roberts of Seize the Day. How much solar do you have on board, and is it enough? <laughs> Every time we seem to get more solar, we get more power hungry. Um, uh, it, it's just the way it is, I think. Uh, the One of the drawbacks of any monohull is that you've only got so much real estate that you can put solar panels mm. on. Um, we initially had no solar on this boat when we bought it. We put 355 watts of solar on top of the cockpit roof, the hard roof. Um, that's... Uh, two large yeah. panels and, and a smaller small. one, yeah. which was the real estate that we had. Um, and no, it didn't go close to, to keeping up. No. We then added another 145 watt panel onto the Davits. Now, it's a genius. I got that panel for a carton of beer. We got two panels for we a carton two, of beer. Two, Good two, deal, I reckon. 245 watt panels yeah. for a carton of beer yep. with a, a guy that was removing them from his boat. Then it, then it cost me eight hundred dollars in stainless work to be able to mount it on the <laughs> on the davits, and then I got smart enough to realise that um, as panels age, they get less efficient. So the hundred and forty-five added a bit, but not a lot. No, it was certainly not enough for what we needed. What we've done now done is um, on those davits, we've put a four hundred watt, what's called a Sun Power Maxian. They're the most efficient panel made. Um, best figures all the way around. They're, they're more expensive, but guess what? You get what you pay for. 
So we've we've now got 755 watts mm -hmm. of solar. <laughs> it probably won't be enough. No, we'll probably run we've, our laptops longer. And anyway, we've <laughs> also got a Rutland 1200 um, uh, wind generator yes. on top of the mizzen, which a lot of people um, are skeptical of wind generators. I was a bit too, um, but then decided if if it can put in you know six amps. Um, in in 10 knots of wind well mm. if it does that all night for 12 hours yeah. hey that's not a bad result um and I, we've, I think, we've, yeah, we've think, actually found it to be good but yeah, i think the main thing with the wind gens what we didn't like was the noise we could hear the yeah. noise of you know we would come into an anchorage and go oh wind gen and we'd move you know to somewhere yeah. else so we didn't want to be that noisy neighbor but the the rutland yeah. 1200s so are quiet. particularly mm. quiet i mean we anchor beside other people and we can hear their wind generator, not ours. Mm. But bottom line, solar, we've got 755 Five watts, watts in total. We've got a wind generator. We think we're going to be close this time when we go out. <laughs> we'll let you know in next Q&A. <laughs> but the, the reality is um, we have a, um, a Honda petrol generator which we fire up to run our, um, our water maker, our yes. Rain Man water maker. Um, and if um, if we have a problem, we can always top up using that. But we honestly think uh, we're probably going to be close. I would love to have a thousand watt, uh, a kilowatt, and I think we'd be there. Bottom line, do we have enough? We, we don't, don't know. know. Yet. <laughs> we'll, we'll let you know. <laughs> we'll, let, we'll let you know. Uh, Castaway crew was asked, "What is the one thing on the boat that you're always fixing?" <laughs> <laughs> well, if you hang around enough sundowners, you'll know it's the toilet. <laughs> and I wanted two on board. <laughs> As Karen said, if you go to toilet. sundowners, there's always a conversation about <laughs> yeah, bloody about toilets. toilets. Yeah. Um, situation is, if you're not aware of boats, um, your toilet is flush with seawater. Right? That's your flushing system. Well, it system. can be it's, flush with fresh water. If you've got enough fresh water, yes. yes. But the vast majority of boats use seawater to flush the toilets. Yes. Now, urine combined with salt water makes calcium deposits. So your toilet hose can start at that big, and as this deposits build up, it just shrinks down to quite often the size no, of your finger. can't even your put finger. your finger through. Um, and that calcium build up happens over time. Uh, we've, we've now learnt mm. over the years that the key is to make sure there's no urine or waste left in the pipe. It either has to all go into the holding tank when you're in, in port, etc., or out into the sea when you're out um, cruising. You've got to get it out of that pipe. And so long flushing. Yep, literally. Long flushing. We, uh, we have electric flush toilets, and um, once the bowl has emptied, we just keep our finger on the button. If, slow 20. If we're out at sea and not filling the holding tank, yeah. I'll hold it for a 20 count. Yeah. Because, hey, who cares? We've got enough yeah. power to run that pump. The holding tank is the problem when you can't and flush that much salt water into. But that's right. You, but a minimum of a 10 second yeah. one gets, you know, it gets it out of the pipe. We and will also use, whilst we're having showers, We'll also put fresh water into the toilet bowl and flush fresh yeah. water through the pipe. And regularly a bit of um, white vinegar. Yes, white, white vinegar. I love white vinegar. I use it for everything on the boat for cleaning. And yep. yes, white vinegar. If we're leaving the boat for any period of time, we actually flush out the salt water and have fresh water all the way through the pipes, then fill the bowl with um, vinegar and flush some oh, of that vinegar. Diluted, <laughs> yeah, not straight yeah. vinegar, because yeah. that could eat away yes. your macerator. Sorry. Yes, sorry. Yeah. Just um, a good good dash of and the then, yeah. white vinegar and in your, in your fresh flush water. And it, flush it into the pipes so that it's also in the pipes. And we have found touch wood everywhere. <laughs> that, um, oh, I haven't had to redo the toilet, or clean out the toilet lines now for... Um, Ooh, a while. Two, two years. A while. Yes, two years. A while. It's, it's over two years since I, I did them and everything's going well. And of course the other trick is we don't put toilet paper down oh, the toilet. Yes, no they toilet tell you the macerators can handle it, etc. It does chop it up, but it gets stuck on any sort of calcium deposit that is in that. And you're pipe. also putting more waste into your holding tank. Yeah. You know, and 
so anyway, we won't go there on the usage of toilet paper and folding and scrunching and whatever. Don't worry about it. We just we, <laughs> we have enough a, to say we have a bin that it goes in and it gets yes, emptied regularly. Yep. David Francis asks, would you advise buying a boat in the Mediterranean as you did, or is it a risk? Um, buying any boat is a risk. Let's just face that we, at the start. Yeah, we. Um, um, we would not buy a boat sight unseen. No. Um, I don't care where it is, we would not buy a boat sight unseen and we would not buy a boat without a professional survey from a good, reputable surveyor that you've mm. checked out before you get the survey done. Um, there are too many things that can be hidden on a boat that you're going to pay for big time later. That you don't even see. Mm. Uh, a good surveyor is worth whatever you pay them plus more. Um, you'll save money every time using a good reputable surveyor so ask around don't just yeah. take the first one in the phone book or whatever like that the boat we bought in the mediterranean el syringa she was um uh the broker was hopeless in the end we told him we didn't even want to talk to him <laughs> and we dealt directly with the spanish owner there were difficulties with language that sort of thing but the reality is uh the boat we bought in the med was less than half the price that we would have paid for it in Australia. Yes. Um, well, less than half the price of an older, of the same mm, model yeah. that we looked at in Australia. Um, would we buy a boat in the Med again? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Without question, we would buy a boat in the yeah. Med again. Um, and to be honest, uh, we've recommended to a lot of people, if they talk about it and you know, should we buy a boat here and sail over there? Should we buy a boat there and sail at home? That was our initial idea. Just but, buy a boat in the Mediterranean and sail yeah. at home. But as I said earlier, we bought it in partnership with a, with a, um, a our Brit mate, and that worked out well for us. It, I know it, some people have problems with it, but no, it worked out well for us. And we're still great mates. Um, but we sailed that boat in the Mediterranean for a couple of seasons. Some things happened which meant we had to come home. But we decided we didn't want to sail a light production boat across the oceans. We wanted something heavier when we did the ocean crossings and that's why we've ended up with um, with our dream time. If you wanted to go and sail the Mediterranean, I think the best thing to do is go over there and buy a boat there. You'll get it a lot cheaper. Sail the boat in the, if you buy well, sail the boat in the Mediterranean, have you two, three, four years even. Yeah. Sell it, come home and get what you want in Australia. Australia. Uh, absolutely the best way. If you're enjoying our videos, please make sure you give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. It really does help us with YouTube to reach more people. If you also hit the bell button, you'll be notified each time we release a new episode. Come sail with us again soon.